Some of us don't want to feed cute little mammals to our snakes. So what are the top five snakes that make great pets that don't need to eat rodents? Today, let's talk about it. My name's Adam, this is Diamond, you're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, stick around. There are a ton of reasons why you wouldn't want to feed rodents to your reptiles, especially snakes. One of them being if you feed a bunch of rodents. One of those reasons is if you feed a bunch of rodents and then one of your snakes drags the rodent to the back of the enclosure and looks like it's eaten and it's not, you come down two days later and it feels like something crawled up your nose and died. This room smells so bad, so bad, because Nikki, one of the hog nose snakes, dragged a rat, I saw him do it to the back of the enclosure and I guess he didn't eat it and it smells so bad. So anyway, let's just get right into it. Number five, Asian vine snakes. These guys are very strange looking. I would imagine that if this was a person, this is Jared Kiso's character from Letterkenny. Say cheese. Just the closed eyes, they look like skeptical shoelaces and that's why people really like them. They look sketchy and different and weird. Now they do actually get quite long. Well, for a snake of this thinness, this girth, I guess, these guys are gonna get to like six feet. They're semi-arboreal. So you'll need somewhat of a big enclosure, but these guys are rear fang venomous. So they have a very mild venom. If you get bit by one, it's gonna be uncomfortable, but you're not gonna die. I, there's no known deaths from an Asian vine snake bite. Usually it's like swelling or a little bit of pain, itchiness, things like that. But why are they awesome? Well, they're beautiful. And the way that they look is interesting and the fact that they're arboreal or semi-arboreal is really interesting. Just all in all, Asian vine snakes are wicked. And of course they are from Asia. I'll throw a map up of their native range. And uh, there's actually a wild population or two known populations, very small pockets in Florida. No way. It seems like anything that can be brought to the US will eventually be invasive in Florida. Just how she goes. It's the way she goes. Sometimes she goes, sometimes it doesn't. She didn't go. It's the way she goes. So in captivity, because some people can't get them switched onto rodents, and this is actually the easiest one on the list to get switched to rodents, but still very difficult, which is why they're on the list. Morning geckos and house geckos are usually what you'd feed to these guys. And I think the reason is because morning geckos, well, parthenogenesis, which just means that they can, you don't need a male and a female to breed. You can, anyway, that's another video. So they're very easy to breed. And if you have a colony of them, you'll get new ones all the time. Or uh, if you want a house gecko, house geckos are really cheap. So kind of more expensive than say a mouse to feed, but they're like four bucks where I am to buy a house gecko. So it's kind of a sustainable food source that isn't a rodent. And that's kind of the gripe with a lot of people. Rodents are cheap and easy to breed. And a lot of the time, small amphibians and reptiles are not. So these guys you can get away with kind of on a budget. Number four, and maybe the most unique and coolest snake on the entire list, dragon snakes. These guys look wicked. These are maybe the craziest looking snake. These have a very specific temperature. We're talking about 72 to 75 degrees. Some people say up to 77. But if you get into the 80s, it can be lethal. These things will literally just croak. They'll just die. So they're very difficult to take care of for most people, especially with their humidity requirement and the dietary thing, obviously. Although they're very fragile, the diet isn't crazy difficult. They're going to eat things like amphibians, tadpoles, uh, small lizards in the wild, but mostly frogs, tadpoles, and fish. So a lot of people in captivity will feed them just those exact things. They're nearly impossible to get onto rodents. Not impossible, but it's very, very difficult, and very few people have been successful in doing this. These guys are from Malaysia and that sort of area. I'll throw up a map of their native range, and they're... I, don't know, I guess the fragility of them is the basic thing. None of these, this is not a care guide for any of these animals, so don't watch this and then go get one and say, I don't wanna take care of it. A lot of people don't know how to take care of these things. There's really not that many care guides around. They're very difficult to care for and they're very hard to find. And a lot of the times they're imported, so not captive bred. There's really not a lot of captive breeding going on. Just all in all, I think they're amazing pet if you really put a lot of effort into them, but this isn't for your average Joe who has a corn snake and a hog nose snake and a ball python is looking for their next snake and it's gonna be kind of close. This is not the same thing at all. It's a very unique snake to take care of. 
Number three, a fan favorite bringing it closer to home, Nerodia. Now, I live in North America. Nerodia are from most of North America, especially the East, and especially the Northeast, where you don't really see tons and tons of biodiversity and types of snakes, especially where I live here in Ontario, part of Canada. We've got several species of Nerodia here. There's nine in total, nine species of Nerodia. They're water snakes, so they're semi-aquatic. <laughs> Crazy, right? And these guys uh, have very different requirements but they're all kind of very similar as well to each other. Because they're semi-aquatic, they're a little bit more difficult to set up in your home. You'll need a bigger enclosure for a snake, which doesn't get that big. I mean, we're all, most of them are gonna be under a meter. So that's like a yard for people who use Imperial. I don't know why you do that still. And as a semi-aquatic snake, they eat exactly what you think they'd eat. They eat frogs and fish, basically, or newts and things like that. But in captivity, you'll see what people do is because they're not a super duper tiny snake, you can actually buy frog legs at a place that sells frog legs. Maybe your supermarket or maybe just like an Asian food store a lot of the times will sell um, frog legs. Make sure that you're getting them from a, an ethical source, of course and they'll feed these to their animals or fish. There's certain types of fish, do your research. Thir certain things like goldfish do not make good feeders. So you have to really dig into it and do a lot of research what species to feed, but you can get those at like a pet store. And like five and four on the list, neither of those are the right number, five and four on the list, these guys aren't the most handleable. Now you can get them to be handleable and there is a little bit more captive breeding being done. So these are less likely to be, come here. These are less likely to be wild caught, which is good. You always want captive bred if possible, but they do have bigger teeth and it does kind of suck to get bit by them and they will musk all over you even if they don't bite you. It is possible to tame them down, it just takes a little bit more work and a lot more work than something like a ball python or a corn snake. Something that people find really interesting about snakes is the ones that don't lay eggs. And these guys, they don't lay eggs. They give live birth and actually pretty substantial litters for their small size. We're talking about like 20 babies at a time. And further to their coolness is the uh, Lake Erie water snake. I think these are the coolest. They have the smallest distribution of any snake snake in North America that we know about because they're like just in Lake Erie and surrounding area and surrounding water. The are really cool. Number two, and maybe the most obvious on the list, African egg eating snakes. There's actually two different species. They're very, very similar. And if you're asking what do, what do these things eat? Eggs, <laughs> that's it. That's all they eat. And it's very different because all the other animals on the list, all the other snakes, they eat like other snakes where they eat it hole and that's it and then they just excrete it these guys don't do that completely instead they've got these projections they're like little pieces of like a bone spur i guess from the back of their throat kind of like this far down if i were a snake so good at explaining things nice execution you're doing terrific and what they do is they puncture the egg the appropriately sized egg they suck out all the nutrient all like basically the liquid inside of it the egg white and the yolk and then they just kind of throw up well not even throw up they just kind of like squeeze out of their mouth the crumpled up shell so very interesting in captivity you'd have little eggs let's suppose quail eggs for a large uh mature adult African egg eating snake and you'd put them around the enclosure they'd wander around swallow them and we've all seen this meme right like this is the goofiest looking snake I actually love egg eating snakes if you can find eggs this is maybe the most interesting snake because they don't even have teeth yeah they're gonna strike at you but they're never gonna break skin because they literally don't have the projections in their mouth that every other snake does that would make you bleed. Number one and the easiest on the list, rough green snakes. And we're gonna put smooth green snakes in there as well because they're so simple. Don't bite my ear. Stop, good Lord. I wish he didn't have teeth sometimes. Just get away from it. These guys are fantastic. They're very tiny. Like these are one of the smallest snakes you can have in captivity that actually do well in captivity. And you'll notice I didn't put blind snakes or ring neck snakes, which fit on this list, but don't do great in captivity. Well, rough and smooth green snakes really do. And these guys in North America are easy to find. Now, there's not a lot of captive breeding going on. So it's likely that you might get yourself 
a snake that was wild caught, especially because you can find them all over North America, especially um, the rough green snakes, you're gonna find them more southeast, and then the smooth green snakes, you'll find them more northeast. In fact, I've literally seen them in my own backyard, for real, on my own property, here in uh, Ontario, which is in Canada. So these are a snake that doesn't have crazy humidity and temperature requirements. They're pretty easy to take care of, no extremes, low or high, and they have a big range that they can live in. So they're very hardy and they are semi-arboreal, which is super cool if you ask me, but they don't need a huge enclosure because they stay so small. And to feed them, they eat insects. They can eat things like crickets. They can eat things like worms, things like that. So they're not difficult by any means to take care of and they look beautiful. And the difference between the rough and green, rough, scale, rough green snakes have a keeled scale and smooth green snakes do not. And if you're looking for something unique that you might want to feed your rough or smooth green snake, think about something like Grubterra. These are black soldier fly larvae, the most ridiculously well-priced item that ship directly to your door if you live in the US. Fantastic prices, and if you want, you can get 10% off by using the code WWR below. Hit the link, go WWR at checkout, 10% off your entire order. And if you're thinking, okay, well, what would I enclose my snake in? What type of enclosure could I set them up in? Well, a cage's PVC would be perfect because it can keep humidity, it can be arboreal, it can be really whatever shape or dimensions that you want. And again, I like when people save money. So code WWR below and you get free door handles. I love this company, absolutely. And the most special thank you so much to the Patreon supporters. Now, Patreon, we discussed last week, we're really gonna bump up the content. There's gonna be more content just for Patreon-only members. For as little as a dollar a month, you get all this extra stuff, you know about extra stuff in my collection I don't talk about, discounts on the merch, and you can see these videos early. So, uh, I think I've talked about everything. Hit subscribe, really appreciate it. Costs you nothing and really helps this channel, and I guess we'll see you on Thursday.